Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. And tonight, our guests are Mark and Katie Hartfield. Uh, Katie is the author of Women in Love. Mark is the director of That Man Is You Ministries. It's all across the nation, uh, over 400 parishes, 20,000 men this coming year it's going to minister to. And they're going to be talking about their own. They have a great uh, wedding story, relationship growing story, and uh, really directed by God, but with a lot of pain and stuff that they had to work through. And uh, it's a very compelling story. Katie is a, has done youth ministry work and a great writer and knows what she's talking about. Has boots on the ground working with young women especially. So, boots on the you. ground, I like boots that on terminology. The ground. Yes, yeah. you, you've infected me, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a new shirt there. I do, what new Battle Ready t-shirt yeah. design here. Yeah. This is nice, you'll see my son came up with this. This is the just one color print design here. It's two wings, mm -hmm. uh, the Battle Ready logo, BR for Battle Ready. Battle Ready, of course, underneath it. Mm -hmm. And on the top it says established 33 AD, which is when our, our Lord gave his life on the cross, rose from the grave, Pentecost, and gave us everything we need to be spiritually battle ready for the spiritual mm -hmm. fight for our souls. And then on the bottom we put Isaiah 40, 31 and Revelation 12, 14 on each side of the shield right down here you can see on the bottom mm -hmm. right there. And the reason for that is Isaiah 40, 31 is the, the, the verse that we get that song from, he will raise you up on eagle's wings, which is not a song I necessarily subscribe to as my own personal theme music. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nothing against what it says, it's just the way it's uh, presented. Uh, put some epic battle music yeah. behind it, I'm okay with it. But the point is, the eagle's wings will raise you up and you will, you will run and not tire, you will, you will walk and not faint. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have the strength of the wings of this eagle. Well, in Revelation 12, 14, Our Lady is given two great wings of an eagle when right. the serpent is trying to destroy her, the, de the devil. And these two great wings of an eagle are given to Our Lady and she is taken into the wilderness and protected for a certain amount of time and kept away from the face of the serpent. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, the wings mm -hmm. of an eagle. So to help us be truly spiritually battle, battle prepared, battle right. ready, right. prepare for the spiritual fight, you know, we brought the, the wings of the eagle in. And, and there's symbolism to these things because they have to do with our faith. And so right. we want to include that in, in, our, in our logos and designs. So battlereadystrong.com if you're interested in getting one of these shirts, we got them for sale there. So right. help encourage people in the spiritual fight. And tonight I know we're going to be talking about you know, marriage and, and true romance and the vocation and chastity and right. purity and all that right. goes with it. I know you're going to get into some really powerful stuff about the heart. And right. that's where the root of being battle ready is, Father. <laughs> it's found in the heart, right? right? The right. heart's got to be ready. The heart's right. got to be open right. so God can grant us those graces and gifts to make us uh, to make us what He wants us to be, true soldiers for Him. Right, it is a, a battle that takes place in the heart. And, and we talk a lot about chastity on Life on the Rock here, and, um, and a lot of us struggle with it, right? Mm. It's, a, it's a virtue, we all, it's a battle, right? The Catechism uses that term, the battle for chastity. Yeah. And uh, I found there's an interesting quote in the Liturgy of the Hours that the priests and religious pray, some lay people. And this is from uh, Baldwin. Uh, he's the Bishop of Canterbury. I'm sure he's high on your reading list, but uh, <laughs> just bear with me. I thought this captures it well. Lord, take away my heart of stone, a heart so bitter and uncircumcised, and give me a new heart, a heart of flesh, a pure heart. You cleanse the heart and love the clean heart. Take possession of my heart and dwell in it, contain it, and fill it. You are higher than the heights of my spirit and closer to me than my innermost self. You are the pattern of all beauty and the seal of all holiness. Set the seal of your likeness upon my heart. In your mercy, set your seal upon my heart. God of my heart and the God who is my portion forever. Amen. I thought that's a beautiful prayer. You know, he's, he's from England. The English have this eloquence that captures something, especially when we're talking about the heart, poetry is fitting to describe that, that struggle, that purification, that desire we have. But take possession of my heart and dwell in it. That's what it takes to live the virtues, uh, all virtues. We need to do it by the power of God. He needs to come into us to transform us. He needs to purify our hearts. He needs to ravish our hearts, right? That we belong to Him. That's a big part of Katie's story, which she's going to tell us about tonight, growing in that, uh, that being taken hold of by our love, belonging to the Lord. And as Christians, we all need to have a sense of that. We all need to have a personal relationship with Jesus and foster that. And the really good news, too, is that we just don't do this by ourselves. Certainly prayer and everything, uh, personal, private prayer is important. But also, we encounter the love of Christ, that love that's poured into our heart, that takes possession of our hearts through other people. And that's their story we're going to hear tonight. 
And I thought of uh, John uh, chapter 17, this is the high priestly prayer. He's praying to his father for the disciples. And he says, I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. That is so powerful, right? He's telling his father, you know, father, that the love you have for me might be in them. So that's just not enfeebled Mark love. That's God, <laughs> Trinitarian, eternal, fullness kind of love, right? He's kicking us up to a divine level of love. So if that's true, if that's really in me by baptism, especially by the gift of the Holy Spirit, when other people encounter that, that's salvific. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm the author of their salvation. Right, salvation. But, there, but there's a presence of God's love in you that, that's right. going to impact their lives. Right, yeah. exactly. Like when we encounter God's love, we are transformed. Mm -hmm. So everyone around us is a bearer of that love, mm -hmm. the very love of God. And that's, uh, we're going to hear that testimony tonight. In, in, in essence, that's, that's what marriage is supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, I can just say, you know, 24 years married to a beautiful woman, my wife Denise, and um, you know, when the heart is engaged with your spouse in the giving, and, right. and what we're talking about there, what you just read, is, is uh, all about the depth of the heart, but there must be that heart, that love of God in the heart first, in order right. to really give to your spouse right. that which can see you through anything and right. everything, right. and only elevate to, right. to, to a, a higher degree. Right. Uh, the beauty of that, that union. And we're going to talk about this tonight too, but when God's love is poured into our hearts, it's a part of our beautiful Catholic tradition is that we're really transformed, mm -hmm. that it, it really changes us. We're lifted up. We are, as St. Paul says, we're made new creations in Christ. So we talk about the battle for chastity, that struggle. There's falls and, you know, we can have sins. And we go to God for mercy and forgiveness, and he, we can be renewed mm -hmm. by Him, right. by the gift of His Spirit. And you know, we can begin again, not just that the sins are forgotten, cast behind God's back if we repent of it, but that also He's building something new with us. He's transforming us, right, to really participate, as Peter tells us in his letters, in the divine nature. You know, that's the transformation that takes place when that Holy Spirit is given to us. You know, so we look at challenges in our own fallen human nature, challenges in the world, but you have the Holy Spirit poured into your heart. Mm. That's what yeah. you have, Doug. <laughs> you might not have a lot of money. <laughs> you know, we might not have the greatest talents, the greatest yeah. abilities or whatever, yeah. but we have the love of God poured into our hearts. Yeah. You, mentioned, that, you, that, mentioned, you mentioned the lack of talents and abilities, right? You're talking about me. Why, no, why, I use the why, inclusive why plural. I said, we, we. But, uh, <laughs> but no. that, that love of Christ conquers sin right. and death. Right. Sin and death. Yeah. And regardless of our talents, our gifts, yeah. our, our prosperity in this world, um, every single heart, every single heart is, is created by God for that kind of love, right. is wired for that. Mm -hmm. You know, God may not grant everybody the same physical uh, abilities, athletic abilities, financial, intellectual, mm -hmm. whatever abilities, but every single heart without fail is given that. That, that ability to, to love and be loved on that level with, with God. And, and there's so much in scripture. Uh, even when, when they ask our Lord, you know, to sum up the commandments, what is the greatest commandment? He says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and mm -hmm. strength. There's something about the heart. Wherever your, your, uh, your treasure is, there also is your heart. It's right. references to the heart constantly from our Lord himself right. about how he wants our hearts and he wants them completely. He wants to, to, to have them just freely given over to him so he can just get inside there and just, you know, deepen the conviction and the commitment. Mm -hmm. And you know, the simplest and the most vulnerable, sometimes the most wounded people manifest that truth mm. more eloquently. You know, if I'm clothed with great talents and abilities and the greatness of this world, sometimes that heart can't manifest itself as mm. clearly. Right. They can't see because of the glory of the world, right? <laughs> it's blinding. But if you've ever been yeah. like with special needs people or something, they can melt you, right? Because they, they witness to the very love that Jesus has for them in a very special way and they can they just have a special presence yeah, of God's yeah. love. Because the, the outside isn't screaming right. so much, look at me. Right. The inside is, is more, more clearly right. coming through. Right. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, Katie and Mark Hartfield. Uh, don't go away. Back in a moment.
<laughs> it's in the battle. <laughs> Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Uh, tonight our guests are Katie Hartfield and Mark Hartfield, married couple, 10 years, two kids. And you all have a ministry, Hearts United Ministries. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Yeah, We're very and, uh, excited. Thank you, Father Mark. You have a, a great uh, courtship story and um, and Mark, too, is a director of That Man Is You Ministry. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. But let's start with your own story. Um, you've got a book out, Women in Love. And uh, can you set that up for us? Tell us about it. Sure. Start, start us. So the story really starts when I was in high school and um, I went to my very first Steubenville Youth Conference and fell in love with Christ and uh, was totally captivated, changed my life. So a few years later, I had the opportunity to serve in their leadership program, which is a week long. And over the course of that week, I was really just called deeper, very deep, um, practically speaking in my faith. So one of the big themes of the week for me was that God had a plan for my life. And he knew what the best way was for me to get to heaven, whether that was religious life or whether that was married life. And so I realized, you know, if I was called to married life, that God knew who it was that I was going to marry one day. And if that was true, then that man must be out there somewhere at that moment. And being a teenager, I knew what it was like to be a teenager. And I realized if this is true, this man needs my prayers. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really decided I was gonna go to war. I was gonna be a spiritual warrior for my future husband. Now, were you a prayerful person before this? I know you had the conversion experience, yes. but did that just kind of start from zero then? Yeah, I mean, I was always really in love with um, being Catholic, but I never knew how exciting it really uh -huh. was to live within God's uh -huh. plan. So my first ever kind of encounter with Christ just set me on fire. So mm -hmm. this was just kind of taking that flame and really bringing it, what does this mean practically in my life? I think it was probably the first practical step on how does this affect my life in my future? Um, and so kind of applying that into my vocation. So I started praying for my future husband, but what I also did was I started to write him letters. I wanted to make him really concrete yeah. that there was a person that I was waiting for. And how did you pray? You're in high school. What did you do to pray? Because it seemed like such a, a great thing inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering, yeah. how, what did he inspire you to do? Yeah, um, well, a lot of it was, you know, there's not a lot of really great pickings when you're 16, 17 yeah. year olds <laughs> looking for your future yeah. spouse, you know? Um, and so what guys I discovered- guys are like really about 11 at that time. Yeah, <laughs> something <laughs> like that around there, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I became really discouraged a lot of times, you know, as I was looking for these certain virtues. So um, I, I really was asking the Lord, you know, wherever he is, you know, with this man, um, if he's struggling with all of these specific things that I would list, you know, Lord, just please come into his life and radically show him how intoxicating it is to be in love with you and to come and um, just turn his world upside down and show him how to love you. And, and a lot of it was, you know, me trying to prepare my own heart. That was what I had to start asking myself. Like, if I'm looking for a guy like this, am I the type of girl that a guy like that would be attracted to, you know? So I was really called on um, as well. So within my own um, experience of that and self-reflection, I would share that, you know, these are the things that I'm struggling with. This is who I want to be for you. This is what I would hope our relationship will be like one day. Um, and it was just a really great um, way to take your emotional teenage side, I think, too, yeah. and, um, and really just give it to the Lord. So you kneel down by your bed, pray the rosary, or how, just talk to God, or? Yeah, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I definitely had a set prayer time um, mm -hmm. that I looked forward to, spending time um, falling in love with At the 16. Lord. At 16? Yeah, in my, my teenage years, yes. Like read some scripture and, mm -hmm. and meditate? Yeah, a little bit of everything. Right. Journaling, I was really big into journaling. And the letter, the letter idea came from? Um, actually, a good friend of mine had heard it from somewhere else and had, we kind of talked about it briefly years and years and years before that. So as this experience was happening, um, it was just something that had resurfaced and mm -hmm. that I decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and I'm going to do it for real. I'm going right. to make this a big deal for me in my life. Yeah. So. so writing letters and, and you just pour out your heart. Can you? Give us a sampling. I'm sorry, Doug, you got to look? <laughs> well, I just on that yeah. point there, the people that you hung out with, your friends, peers, mm -hmm. um, what was the conversation like with them regarding this? Did they know that you were on this uh, this crusade to yeah. 
pray for and help be involved in the spiritual uh, formation of your future husband who you had no clue who would be? Yeah, I was really blessed in high school. I had an incredible youth program and that was where I found so much fellowship and those were my best friends. And so um, not only did they know about it, but we were like all on board. So okay. what we started to refer to our husbands to be, which we shortened to our HGBs and that was like our thing. Like we would talk about it, we would pray for each other's HGBs, things like that. So. So th you had a good support group then. Of oh people yeah. With you. Well, that, and that obviously helps yeah. tremendously. Nobody was mocking you or, yeah. or ridiculing you for yeah, it. Yeah, it was it was our thing. So awesome. And family members, did they know about this? Uh, they did. They did. I don't think it was probably as talked about. Um, they think as it was just kind of like a cute to, thing she's probably. doing. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably at the time. Um, yeah. So. And then you had some real struggles in there too in your life. Tell us I about did. that. I did. So um, I came home from this experience um, of this leadership training and a few months later my dad left my mom a note and he said that he didn't love her anymore and that he was leaving our family. So over the course of the next two years my dad would leave and he would come back and he would leave and he would come back and it was just this horrendous um, tumultuous experience of really causing myself to question you know is, is all of this true? Is this, is this what my life is gonna be like one day, you know? Um, and challenging these ideals that I had felt the Lord was putting on my heart at this time um, that I was in high school. So um, really what kept me grounded so many times was this hope, like this hope that it didn't have to be like this for me. Um, and so that was, I really dove in to my prayer at that point, desperately. And it also burdened you to help care for the family as well with your father? Oh yes. Maybe? Yes, definitely. I have a younger brother, uh -huh. um, and I guess that's kind of the older sister uh, uh -huh. role. You know, it felt very maternal to kind of step into those shoes and um, and kind of mature in that way. And I remember specifically a night in my room on my knees, just begging and crying out to the Lord and feeling like he was telling me, like, Katie, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this experience for mm. other people and for good. And that just gave me so much hope, knowing that there were would be fruits of it in some capacity at some point. So. That, is, that is so true. We had a guest on recently who talked about that, his own struggles with same-sex attraction, and he really was, he just thought all this pain was lost, mm -hmm. and that's, he was really kind of raging, but when he realized what our faith taught, how God uses that, how it's purifying for us, but also you can use that suffering uh, to help others, St. Paul tells us, mm -hmm. but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what happens? Sure. You go away to college. So I went away to college, um, and meanwhile, I don't know if you want to share what was kind of going on with you, in the. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back to my high school days, it, my life looked a lot different than Katie's, and I wasn't really uh, thinking about my future spouse at the time. Um, for me, everything in my world was sports, and mm -hmm. for me, that was basketball. My dad was a high school basketball coach. And so from six years old, I was going to basketball camps and, and going that route. Interesting enough, and, and you guys all know this, you know, in our culture, when you excel in sports, things tend to just come easy for you, and that can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So in high school, um, excelling at sports and just in basketball, it's the popularity scene, and mm -hmm. just I feel like I, I fully integrated into kind of the high school party scene, and it's a really slippery slope. So while I was going to Mass every Sunday still and, and came from a really good family, my life, those other six days of the week, didn't match up with my life on Sunday. And I would say I still loved God and He was still very important to me, but there was just this, it wasn't a full integration of my faith. And so there was a lot of uh, moral decisions that, that were just not good. Mm -hmm. And so in short, Katie, if she would have met me at the time, she would not have been interested <laughs> in who I was at the time. And So were you writing letters maybe to your future basketball team? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what pro team you were going to play for. Exactly. That's Dear what... Celtics, I can't tell you how much I look forward to signing a contract. If I knew how to write, that's, those, are the letters <laughs> I would have, those are the letters I would have been writing. Um, but interesting enough, so my, I, that was my life throughout high school and b between high school and college. So between my senior year of high school, and my freshman year of college, I was in, was not in prayer, nothing abnormal about this night. It was a normal summer night and I was taking a shower. Um, and the only way I can describe the experience is that, is if the Holy Spirit just flooded the room. And I mean, no joke, I fell to my knees that night and wept mm. for an easy 15 minutes. I don't know how long it was, but 
And I felt this just deep truth penetrate to the depths of my heart and the depths of my soul. And it wasn't something I'd never heard before. It was simple. It was the gospel truth that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And it was really personal that night and all my sins just started rushing through my head and I continued to cry. Um, the interesting thing about it also is that it wasn't just a moment of sorrow, but there was this joy. I mean, I experienced God's mercy all at the same time. I still knew that I needed to go to confession, but at the same time, I experienced, um, yes, yeah, sorrow for my sins, but, but joy and, and His mercy and just this encounter with Christ. So there was a real, almost like a, some sort of infusion or gift of just knowledge. Absolutely. Just a real reflective knowledge of yourself and where you were at. I, that describes it better than anything else. It was, it was as if I was blind and now I could see, mm -hmm. and it was clear precise truth, wow. Jesus died for my sins, and no joke, before I went to bed that night, I made a definitive decision to give my life to Christ wow. that night. And I didn't know at the time exactly what that meant. I knew there was a handful of things I needed to stop doing, <laughs> <laughs> and I knew there was a handful of things I needed to start doing, mm -hmm. and that kind of propelled me out on my journey and uh, never really looked back. So, wow. and I knew in that moment, interesting enough also, is someone somewhere was must have been praying for me because it just it just came right, right. well we're going to take a quick break we'll leave you on that cliffhanger what happens <laughs> next so we'll be back in just a moment Welcome back. Let's pick up where we left off. Uh, what happened next? There's an amazing coincidence with that, what happened there to Mark, isn't yes. there? Yes. So we both um, transferred to Franciscan University the same semester. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I find myself at Franciscan. It's kind of this new leaf. It's a few years later after everything had happened. And um, so I'm in my first theology class at Franciscan, and I find myself sitting next to this good looking boy. So I think I did what anybody in the situation would do. I avoided all eye contact with him whatsoever. <laughs> so what happened later was um, I started seeing him everywhere that I was going on campus. I'm no, like, I, I'm sorry, had Mark shown up at the school yet? At oh, well, <laughs> you'll see. We'll get there. <laughs> Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> yeah. Calm down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> so, so I started seeing him everywhere that I'm going. I'm checking my mail. I'm at mass. I'm eating lunch, like walking to class everywhere I go. But I knew that I sat next to him every day and that he knew that I sat next to him every day, but we had never talked. So every time that I'm walking by him, it's like this super awkward moment. Like, do I smile? Should I throw a head nod, wave? Like, continue to avoid all eye contact. So every time I walk by him, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so finally, I'm like, one day, I have to put an end to this. I'm walking to class. I'm like, today is the day. Today is the day I'm going to talk to him. So sitting in class, class ends, put my backpack on. I'm like, tomorrow, tomorrow is the day. I'm going to talk to this guy. So that very same day I walk out into the hallway and Mark is waiting for me there. And he's like, I keep seeing you everywhere. I'm not really sure who's stalking who in this situation, you know? Um, and so we introduce um, ourselves to each other. We both go have lunch. And we kind of merged these awkward schedules into one another. So Mark really became my best friend on campus. Um, so for the next six months, we're just spending all kinds of time together. But it wasn't official out. dating necessarily? It or? wasn't. Okay. It wasn't. And a lot of that was, um, well, all of that was me, really, that I had so much of what you guys were talking about earlier, you know, of this heart of stone mm -hmm. and, um, and desiring this heart of flesh. Like, I, I had no desire to put myself in a position where my heart could be broken. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I did not want to be vulnerable and to you give anyone that power men, over me. Ex right? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. definitely. And I recognize that. And yeah. um, so we had multiple conversations and I was just not. Yeah, not we should interested. say, too, like part of the burden for you, your father leaving was you had in high school, you're having to work and really mm -hmm. care for your brother, help out your mom. And financially, you guys were hurting. So, I mean, it's a real sacrifice. Yeah much greater emotional pain, but also other kind of. But the coincidence too, is that the shower moment was 
What, what was yeah. going on in your life? So there? I'll go ahead and let you tell that yeah. part. So fast forward a little bit, yeah. we start dating several months later, uh, the second semester uh -huh. that we were there. And then deep into our dating relationship, we're actually, it was a summer. Mm -hmm. So Katie's back in Colorado and I'm in Houston and, and we're talking on the phone one night. And it sounds like she's really on to something. And she's just like, Mark, can you tell me the exact date of your conversion? And so I told her the date and I, I hear her shuffling through papers. I'm like, I, what, is, what in the world is going on here, <laughs> right? And, she's, and I hear her kind of get quiet and she's like, you're not gonna believe this. And then she starts reading to me out of her prayer journal from the very week, precise week of my conversion. And she's reading me her, her prayers. And it was when she was on Young Apostles and she's praying most intensely for the conversion of her future spouse. For his yeah, that was the week and you felt inspired. You'd already had like a conversion experience, but that was the week and you felt inspired so to pray. To pray specifically. Yeah. And she says, she asked God to convert holy men into the world. Mm -hmm. And then she goes through a laundry list of things that they may be struggling with. Right. And that was my laundry list right. of things. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite part at the end is where she says that, um, that these men would have this, this desire how did you write it? Sorry. Um, sorry. It's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> Is it in the book? No. Um, but it will be in the movie. It will be in the movie. You want a movie and certainly the musical. Yeah. Right. But that holiness would be their consuming de desire, right. that that would be what they long for, and yeah. that became the consuming desire of my heart. I mean, well, I like what you said earlier, um, Katie, about, you know, that you, you would hope that, you know, Lord, let him have this intoxicating love with you. I just, that's a great way of looking at it, intoxicating love. That's a great prayer that we would pray that God would give us that intoxicating love, that gift, you know, and, and of course, knocked you at your knees. And, uh, Absolutely. And got it started. Yep, and then, and when I even tell my conversion story, a longer version, the r reason I even tell the, anything about the past is because that moment, even that one little moment in the shower, that taste of heaven that I experienced was better, it was more intoxicating than any other intoxication I'd had before that. I mean, it was, it was more intoxicating. Right? Oh, literally. It was, it was the most intoxicating moment of my life. And so, it was, so doesn't that drive you now? I mean, I know you work with That Man Is You, great outfit, great organization. Steve's doing great work there, and, and you're obviously a big part of that. Uh, you know, you, you want to convey that to others out there, because you've been on both sides of that. I've had the physical intoxication. I've had a taste of the spiritual intoxication. Guys, you got to understand there's right. something over here that's, that's just, it's through the roof amazing compared to this ridiculous finite moment of a physical intoxication right. or, or a high or whatever you're, you're going I mean, after. St. Paul says, I consider all things loss mm. compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Mm. I mean, and that was my experience. Before I ever met Katie, that's what I was already telling people right away. The first week, you know, after my conversion is everything else I've ever done in my life that I thought was fun at mm. the time is loss, is rubbish, it's nothing um, compared so, to knowing Jesus so basketball Christ. championships, trophies, awards? No, know. I mean, literally, I was on my way to go play college basketball that mm. summer. I called my coach and told him I'm not coming. I mean, my conversion was, it was a big deal, and I'm like, I would rather read the New Testament. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I read the New Testament. I read the New Testament that summer. It's a whole um, different kind of playbook. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. Well, let's, let's talk about the story that, you know, Katie, for six months or so, you just wanted to be friends. Mm -hmm. How did that change? Well, um, it was a process, a long and very, very painful mm -hmm. process. Um, you know, we had lots of, of conversations um, of me just trying to explain to Mark, you know, why, why this was not uh, possible at this time. And, and remember one night, it was probably the most intense of these, of these conversations, you know. Um, and Mark, he tells me, I keep telling, you know, using the cliche line, like, it's not you, it's not you, it's not you. And he's like, Katie, it is me. Like, I'm the one who wants to love you. Like, I'm the one who wants to, um, you know, to save you and all of these beautiful things. It's me, it is me. Um, and so, you know, I realized like later after this conversation, um, what that kind of really drew out of me is like, this is what God is saying to me is Katie, I, it is me. Like, I'm the one who wants to heal you. I'm the one who wants to love you. I'm the one who wants to save you. Will you just let me be that for you? Um, and at that moment, I, I couldn't. I was still, you know, in this, um, and just felt like I was really imprisoned by, by my own pain. Um, so over the course of the next several months, it was like, that was just this nagging thing, you know, like mm -hmm. I've got to face it. I have to own up to it. Um, and so eventually, um, 
It's funny, I was having a conversation with my mom, actually, um, right before this, and she was like, you know, Kitty, what would you do if Mark did what you asked him to do and he he moved on and he found another girl? And suddenly, like within me, I'm like, I want to beat up that hypothetical girl. <laughs> like, in that moment, I'm like, okay, now I know how I feel. I didn't really know, you know? And so what I had a decision to make, and my decision was, am I going to trust in the Lord and in his plan for me? And am I gonna put myself out there and let, um, let myself be vulnerable and available to be hurt? Or am I gonna miss out? Am I gonna miss out on um, God writing my love story? And so um, I decided I, I, had to, I had to go for it. And so right. um, that was kind of how you know, we had the, the conversation, you know, I like you and I like you too. And so <laughs> it all happened, you know. This, this whole story though with you, Katie, is, it's got to relate to a lot of women out yes. there. So many oh, yeah. ladies are hurt by men right. um, and, you know, they do take that chance and it doesn't always work out. Yes. What, do you, what do you say to them? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that the... Not that you have all the answers for everyone yeah, out there you. who's going through this. <laughs> Disclaimer. You know. Uh, you know, the thing is, like, um, when we trust in, in God's will for us, um, He's a Father who keeps His promises. And so sometimes God calls us to something in order to show us, I'm calling you to something else, to answer those questions within us. But I think that the very deep... Um, part of the message and of the story and of why it resonates is because it's a message of hope, that it's a message of wherever you are and whatever has happened in your life, like the Lord has something greater for you and that suffering breeds love and life. And what I like about that story is that Mark pursuing you actually drove you into the arms of God first before you could come back to have the relationship Definitely. with Mark, that he used Mark in a powerful way to break through. Definitely. But it's a good plan. <laughs> yeah. And that too, in all this, we, you know, we talk about the cross and its meaning in our life. And, you know, Mark had all this stuff on the outside going great for him, mm -hmm. but he wasn't the one praying. Mm -hmm. You had this incredible cross which drove you to your knees to pray. And you can see the fruitfulness, right, that God. But I think Doug raises a good point. Uh, what do you tell young women? I mean, you told me earlier, you tell them like two things about God pursuing them. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, the message, you know, the book is called Woman in Love. And so, I mean, generally you look at that and think it's about this story or whatever. And so that is definitely a big part of it. But mm -hmm. um, the whole phrase woman of love, uh, woman in love is one that we came up in my youth program when I was a youth minister as a alternative to being a woman of God. So like in a, a men's talk, you know, they come back and they're like all fired up about being a man of God. Like it's so manly. They're ready to go out live in the jungle, kill their own meat, battle ready, be a man of God, right? Yes, <laughs> right guys? So. Yeah. And when we talk about being a woman of God, like I just tend to think more of like churning butter, little house on the prairie, you know? And so, so this is really like the phrase that has encapsulated, you know, what we want to be. We want to be women in love. We want to talk about it. We want to hear about it. We want to experience it. We want to be women in love and let it transform us. So that is what being a woman in love is all about with Christ. That's exactly what happens, that he is pursuing us and that he is waiting anxiously um, for us to notice that he's the man waiting in the background that is perfect for us so that he can prove to us that, he, that we're right, that he is the man that is big enough to hold us when we cry, rejoice with us, all of these different things to um, come and to really capture our hearts. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, girls are all about relationship, all about love first kind of thing. And, and you're convincing them that Jesus is pursuing them and they're worthy of that love. Yes. And when he becomes the first love, this is kind of my whole mantra within the book, is yeah. when we allow Jesus to be our first love, then he is free to deliver us in his time to our second. And yeah. that is our vocation. So. And you talk about the, the woman that bust into the dinner party where Jesus is at, and what does she do? The yeah. sinful woman, right? Yeah, so I love the image of um, this woman who comes in, and the scripture says she brings her alabaster box, which mm. at the time was um, a dowry. This was the Jewish um, people's dowry. So the idea was that when a Jewish girl was born, she would receive this alabaster box full of perfume, break it at the feet of her husband on the night that they're married. And it was the symbol of giving her past and giving her future. So this is what this woman does in this story. She comes recklessly and she lays it all out, her past, her future, 
everything, her most precious and possession. very complicated, very emotional. Very emotional. Very needy. Yes. Very high maintenance. Yes. And but she Jesus could handle it. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and he takes it and he replaces it with something else, you know, with right. a desire, with his desires. Right. Um, and I just love that image of, you know, he was waiting for her from before eternity. And that's the key line. Say that replacing or the desires. Yes, that is the key, yeah. is that he, he takes our desires, he takes our emotions, he takes our mess, our ugly cry, everything, and that he doesn't leave it void, that he replaces it with his desires. And when we want what God wants, then it happens, you know? I think that's a great message to give our, our young women out there, that he, God isn't afraid of your emotions, your desire. Bring it to the yes. Lord, right? Let it transform, let it transform it. Katie, how many girls do you think out there, women, even adult women, still struggle so much with their own self worth that they don't feel they could bust into that room, yeah. so to speak. Um, they don't feel that they could go before Jesus. Yeah. I mean, as a man, I know, you know, and, and Mark probably speaks to this too, is, you know, you, you know, you go to confession and, and, you know, sometimes you're confessing the same sins over and over. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there are guys out there who just, they, they kind of go into what you call the pretzel position where they just, they just kind of curl into themselves. They feel like they, mm -hmm. they just, I can't, I can't, I can't be good enough to be loved. I can't overcome this. I can't be a good husband and father. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys really, really struggle with that. Mm -hmm. um, you think that's happening a lot with a lot of ladies? They're oh, really yeah. struggling with their own self-worth enough to even present to Jesus? Themselves? Oh yeah, probably all of them, really. <laughs> um, it's, it's a huge, that's the issue I think for women is um, their own image of mm -hmm. who they are. And um, what I talk about a lot with um, the young women is, um, you know, I use this image of, you know, our, our purity and um, who we are and our sexuality and all these things as a gift and that God gives us this gift and I have like a literal gift when I'm talking to the girls and um, that it's meant for us to give away, you know, as like our dowry, the same type of an image. And so when we sin and we make all these choices, it's like we're you know, ripping these pieces off of the gift. We're untying the bow. Um, and if what if this is the gift that we have to give to our future spouse? Um, but the kicker is that when we go meet Jesus in the sacrament of reconciliation and we come to him as this broken, wounded woman, um, he doesn't just like take our gift and tape it back up and retie the bow, but he does what he promises in the book of Revelation. He makes all things new. And at that point, when I'm talking to the girls, I bring out, you know, like this new package and he makes us, he recreates us because he's God and that's his promise of what he wants to do for us. Um, and so oftentimes um, these girls will come up to me after they're, afterwards and they're like, so you're saying that I'm like really new. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm saying. And they're like, what if I have, you know, given, given my gift away? You're saying that he really recreates me new. Yep, that's, that's the message, that's the message. And I think that's the message that we all need to hear is that, that God wants to come into our lives and that when we let him, incredible, incredible things happen. All we have to do is say yes. That is such a, that convicted me. I, I stole that in the opening segment from you, <laughs> okay. but uh, that's Good. a great point. We're gonna take a quick break. Be back in a moment with Mark and Katie. Welcome back. We got to move here in the story. Uh, you have a ton of letters written to yes. Mark. He doesn't know anything about it. You're now dating. What happens? So fast forwarding, we get <laughs> we get married. Sorry, we get engaged first, uh -huh. and it's the night before we get married. So right. it's our rehearsal dinner. After the rehearsal dinner, knowing this is the last time we're going to see each other before I see her walking down the aisle, mm -hmm. um, Katie. We still a few moments together, and Katie kind of gives me this gift, and it's a three ring binder. <laughs> And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> and it's like decorated, just like a girl would decorate it. And I'm like, what do I do with this? And she's like, read the first letter and you'll understand. And at this point, I knew about her prayers for me and my conversion and all that matching up, but I didn't know she was writing me letters. I thought it was just a prayer journal. So I open it up and I read the first letter. And in that moment, I understood that she had been writing letters since she was 17 years old to her future husband, her HTB, her husband-to-be, right. um, and hundreds of letters, and just 
going, going through them, um, how she was praying for me, going to war for me. And so, I mean, I, I, I read this letter and was completely just blown away. Imagine mm -hmm. the night before you get married and you just see this just love that's just so um, unfathomable. It's, I mean, it's a human love, but you experience mm -hmm. God's love through it. And uh, it's transforming. Love is transforming. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to reciprocate that love. Um, yeah. And your story shows the primacy of grace, you know, the primacy mm -hmm. of prayer first. And we hear that, well, St. Dominic's Feast Day, you know, he started the Order of Nuns before he started the Order of Preachers, right? He wanted to get these nuns praying in the cloister for the success, and you, you witnessed that. Now, both of you today, you all, you both speak, and, and you have a special ministry, Mark. Tell us about that. Right. I work for That Man Is You men's mm -hmm. program, uh, which is a program of Paradisus Day. And it started nine or ten years ago. You have to tell us what Paradisus Day Paradisus is. Day is Latin for the paradise of God. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's what God intended for marriage. So I work for a, a ministry. We're all, we're all about marriage and family. Um, and, and marriage is called to be a paradise. Right. You know, it was the paradise of pleasure before sin entered into the world with Adam and Eve there. And, and Christ has restored that for us. Um, so we've created a, a men's program. And uh, this is the work of Steve Bowman. And I'm just... Uh, humble servant of the ministry. Um, but basically, we started nine years ago in Houston, Texas, and we just simply, Steve started a men's program at the local parish. And everyone told us no one's gonna show up on a Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. before work. Mm -hmm. And the first week, 124 guys walked through the door. And before that first year was over, you could feel something special was taking place in the room and the guys loved it. We were getting guys from other parishes coming and they were saying, how can I bring this back to my parish? next year. Now you uh, were there at the beginning? So the first year was Steve by himself. Okay. And when he realized that we were going to try to replicate this mm -hmm. and spread it throughout the country, that's I was hired that next summer. Um, so I've been, that was the first employee and uh, we worked out of Steve's house the first five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But we've, I've seen the program grassroots go from one parish to 16 to 40 and this, this September will be in almost 500 parishes. Uh, 20,000 men throughout the country, over 40 states, and truly, I mean, witnessing it from day one, um, it's a work of the Holy Spirit, because we haven't, we don't have a marketing person on staff, it's the men who experience the program, and then they go on to tell other men about the program, um, and it's, it's just spreading like wildfire. So they come together once a week, they watch a set of DVDs. Yes, yeah. so we, we create a a DVD for them yeah. so they don't have to do any content of their own. So we give them a 26 week program. It's DVD based and it's parish based. So we, and then we teach them. We don't just hand it off to them either. Right. We actually teach them. We have a beautiful manual laid out so where we can give guys step one, do this, step two, do this, mm -hmm. all the way through. Uh, we actually give them the program free and we ask them to let their men come for free. Um, we take a free will offering, right. a donation campaign for the men. That's how yeah. we get funded. Right. But it's all free to the parish uh, to host the program. So it's 26 weeks over the winter, spring. Yep, you have yeah. a 13-week a, a fall semester yeah. and a 13-week spring semester. The spring semester always has a built-in Lenten journey. And mm -hmm. the guys just love the Lenten journey. Right. That's their favorite part every year. And that's done for three years. Three years, three separate years. Right. We've got some additional content after that, but we feel like we have a, our base program is a three-year program. So essentially and Steve has written a trilogy here. He's written a trilogy. Yeah. And when you look at the trilogy, it's amazing in hindsight how Joseph is hidden within all this. You know, Joseph is the, the man of Scripture, the just man of Scripture. And he's revealed in Scripture as the just man before God. And that's what our year one is about. It's the man's relationship with God. You've got to get that right first before you can go anywhere. And then so Joseph, that we talk about prayer and the sacramental life. Right. And absolutely. Moral teachings. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And even sin and taking personal mm -hmm. responsibility for your action. And it's becoming a man after God's own heart. So we, we right. try to teach them how to do that in year one. Uh, year two, it's Joseph was the spouse of Mary. And so we, we take on that relationship between the man and his spouse. Um, and then Joseph was the foster father of Jesus. And so we focus on fatherhood. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of Don Bosco's methods on, on parenting. Uh, he raised a lot of boys. Right. And mm -hmm. we take his methods and, and bring them into the home. And so the guys walk through the life of St. Joseph. He's hidden within all of it, but they walk through the life of St. Joseph. And we see man as 
as, as St. Joseph is the man. Right, so you have a lot of content and then you also have small groups that are formed, yes. right? Tell us about the small groups. Yes, so a typical session is about an hour and a half, uh, give or take a little bit, but they, they meet in the morning for breakfast, they've got a 30 minute DVD presentation and a 30 minute small group. Um, you've got to have the combo of great content and then small group. That's really the secret that makes it work because the guys have to have something to talk about in the small group. The content gives them something to chew on. Right. And the content also helps them to take the content and the program and make it applicable, ac applicable in their own lives. And they get to hear the wisdom from all the guys in the group. They have accountability. Um, the coffee and the donuts help too. Coffee and donuts yeah. are good. Yeah. <laughs> now they, you also set up like leaders, right, within each parish. That right. Lead the yeah. Interesting enough that most of the leaders and, are volunteers, and mm -hmm. that's a part of the program. Um, I'm really huge on, but a lot of people don't see it. Is it, we always just talk about the men coming to the program, but the program actually allows men to be disciples in their communities. So you've got guys at their churches, lay men, um, who may not be getting involved in other men's spiritual lives. Right. So that man is you, we're giving them this content and this avenue. And I feel like we say, you know, 20,000 men are going to it, but what's really neat is all those men who are becoming disciples of Christ. We right. have small group leaders, we have core team leaders. All these guys are having to step up in their faith, really learn more about their faith so they can lead other men. And Katie and I, in our ministries, we're really big about not just going out and saving a few. And so mm -hmm. even when her youth ministry approach, it was all about, let's take the ones who get it and teach them how to become disciples. Right. And that's where fruits can become 60 fold, 100 fold and so on. And I think there's something that man is you, I think is doing that. It's, it's not something that's talked about a lot, but I think discipleship. I think that is so key. I mean, some of the mega churches are really good with small groups. And we Catholics need to bring that and, and do that ourselves, model that. What do they tell you as they exit this, the most touching parts of the program? The men tell you. Um, there's all sorts of stories, right? Mm -hmm. So marriage and family stories. I mean, marriage is saved right. um, that would have been lost. Yeah. We, so you have all kinds of dramatic stories like that. Um, guys coming back to confession that haven't been in years and years. But what you have a whole, whole lot of is good men who become great men. You know, that, that really their hearts just turn towards their families and start spending time with their kids and really um, seeing their, that their family life is their vocation. Right. That their spouse and their, their fatherhood right. is a vocation. And that's the key word you guys center in on a lot of fatherhood, revealing the face of the father. Yes. As the family absolutely needs a father and the mother there. What do the men learn about being a father that a lot of them don't have, say? Is there a common? Right. On a big picture approach, we use, this is my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes of John Paul II and Steve uses it in our program is, men relive and reveal on earth the very fatherhood of God. That is, to me, um, an unbelievable dignity that I can't believe I get to bear in the right. world. And, and I think the guys learn, they, they learn that through the program slowly and, but surely it gets um, embedded in their minds. That's the transformation that takes place. So they go home and live that, a father that's rich in mercy for their children. And men need to realize that calling to reveal the father, the face of the father yes. in the family. Yes. I mean, men are so pushed aside by the culture and whatever, marginalized, but uh, imagine the transformation on family life and right. culture right at this half. John Paul, he has another quote, and I will, I'll probably mess it up, but in essence, what he says mm -hmm. is that the key to interpreting reality is to realize that Satan's attack is against fatherhood. That's his, been his attack from the very beginning, and that's his, all of his attacks. Is he's trying to des destroy fatherhood, and that once we understand that, we will start to be, a, be able to understand reality. And I, I feel like a lot of work needs to be done to explain what fatherhood is, and to help men to grow in that. We've had a lot of explanation about women, the call of women is right. happening now, so the time for a call. I mean, we got, let's get the information out there. We got a little bit of time. <laughs> What's the websites, phone numbers? Passport numbers, whatever. What do we need? <laughs> Start with you. <laughs> um, well, you can find us at womaninlove.org. Uh -huh. Org. Um, and we're also on Facebook, Women in Love by Katie Hartfield. Um, Twitter at WIL Ministries. Mm -hmm. So that's us. And unfortunately, you have to say this, but woman, woman in love. You have to do the singular woman version. In love. Uh, unfortunately, in our times, if you 
type wrong letters, you might get to some that crazy website. Oh. Yeah. Um, but our men's program is thatmanisyou.org. T H A T I S Y U. Thatmanisyou.org. It's amazing when you say that man is you, how many people think you're saying. Batman is you. It happens. It happens I'm often. Like, that's, I mean, I guess it'd be a good name for a men's program. But. That would wake up a lot of guys to the superhero aspect right. of who we are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could run with it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, Keep up the great so work. Much. Thank you for God's great. hand is upon you, obviously. Thank you. But, uh, well, may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace and send His Holy Spirit into your hearts. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See you next week.